very excited about, uh, about being here this evening for two reasons. First, first, this is one of my very favorite books of the year, and second, it's written by my sister. Uh, what it's an extraordinary coincidence. Um, my sister, Amanda, and Carrie have both done something that is extremely difficult. What Carrie's done is to start a magazine, and I have a little bit of experience with that in my, in my years, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful thing, a labor of love that we all benefit from, and I'm, I'm sure hopefully many of you are familiar with Cherry Bomb and will become more familiar with it in the future. Um, the, uh, <laughs> what Amanda's done is, is written a book, uh, which is a really very hard thing to do. I know because I've never written a book. <laughs> and I've spent 22 years not writing a book. And, um, uh, and I think writing a book the easy way is hard. Writing a book the hard way is almost impossible. And I know that Amanda wrote this book the hard way because of the phone calls. <laughs> the first call was, um, Rufus, I'm, uh, I'm outside of Mumbai, and I'm about to get into a small, very old, decrepit-looking airplane and intentionally fly into a monsoon cloud because we're going to seed the cloud you know, to try to help the crops grow. And <laughs> to which I, of course, said, like any sensible older brother, that's totally insane. You don't, you're, you're a writer. You can just interview the, the pilot. You don't have to get on the plane. That's entirely unnecessary. Next call was like, Rufus, I'm in Ethiopia. I'm deathly ill. I haven't eaten in a week. I'm covering this famine, and I can't get to a hospital. There really aren't any around here, and um, and I'm in a I, I'm in a remote airport. And um, can I say it? Should I or should I not? Use a euphemism. <laughs> I, I've, I've, had a con I've had a continence problem in my trousers. Uh, and here I am, and, 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 uh, and I'm like, what are you doing? This is, you know, you can just use the telephone to, make, to interview people when you're writing a book. You don't have to do all this stuff. Uh, and the next one was like, I'm, I'm being asked to sign something saying, saying that if I die, I acknowledge that I might die from eating this lab-grown meat, although it's highly unlikely that I would die. But nonetheless, it does seem like a decision to decide to sign this thing. And once again, you know. Um, but, uh, uh, and I thought, you know, sis, you don't have to do it this way. And then I thought, this is the same sister whose favorite quote is something, something along the lines of, um, that which gives light must endure the burning. That is not a favorite quote of someone who likes to do things the easy way. Of course, it's, we all benefit from her having done this the hard way over four or five years, reported this extraordinary book, uh, which has resulted in an extraordinary set of, of, of reviews. As you may know, you know, John Kerry called, the former uh, uh, Secretary of State, called it a, a beautifully written triumph, rave reviews uh, from all quarters, just uh, featured on Fresh Air. I think tomorrow morning she's going to be on Morning Joe. Uh, and uh, so this, is, this, is, this book is making a splash, and can't wait to learn more about it this evening. Thank you. Testing, testing. Am I on? Am I on? Okay. Mic check. Oh, I think we're on. Yeah, we're good. This, Amanda, you're this good? This sounds more on. Then go for this. the one I'm that do sounds the more on. Okay. Totally. Hi, everybody. This is so nice. We've got a packed house here at the Strand. It's nice, so nice. It nice really couldn't be nicer. For our friend I, from Nashville. There are, there are a couple seats, you know. There's one seat. <laughs> okay, there's one seat. But anyone who wants two to seats, use it. Two seats. If anybody wants to move up, come on up. All right, I don't even know where to start. Thank you, Rufus. It's always nice to have your brothers talk about, um, talk about you. They'll always tell the story that you don't want them to tell. So thank you for the, the story about <laughs> the incontinent. <laughs> but um, uh, my name's Carrie Diamond. I'm the host of Radio Cherry Bomb, which we are recording tonight. Um, we'll be airing soon. Um, I am the founder of Cherry Bomb Magazine. We're a magazine about women and food. Rufus was, uh, we shared an office for a little while. So I do know your brother. When you were like, you know my brother. And I was like, oh, there we go. There's yeah. the sound. Thank you. Um, so anyway. This book is amazing. I'm thrilled that all of you have this book. I can't believe it only took you five years to write this book because you will just read this and it's it's sort of like the equivalent of watching a thriller on television or, or in the movie theater. You kind of just can't believe what you're reading and, and the story just propels you forward. And because it's about food, which is so obviously crucial to our daily lives, um, it sort of takes on this absolute additional layer of importance. Uh, so Amanda is a professor um, at uh, Vanderbilt in Nashville, and she's based in Nashville. So thank you for coming to New York for the book launch. Um, the first question I, and for those of you who 
don't know the title of the book, The Fate of Food, What We'll Eat in a Bigger, Hotter, Smarter World. And I'm sure because you're here, you care about the food systems, you care about climate change and all of that. Um, so you will care deeply what Amanda has written about. So the first thing I need to ask you is just, first Sorry. thing I need to ask you Thank is you. just yeah. the why. Why did you decide to tackle this subject? Well, um, there are so many, I mean, there's so many sort of things that fed me, or led me, and fed me, I suppose, um, uh, as I sort of began to get into food. But I, I was an energy reporter for, um, I mean, 10 years, and uh, uh, wrote about technology and energy and, and uh, environmental policy. Um, and I noticed when I was um, on tour for my first book, and the editor of my first book, Gail Winston, is here, Power Trip, uh, and uh, which means a great deal to me. Thank you so much. Um, and everybody wanted to talk about food. And they were really interested in the relationship between environment and food and all the fossil fuel inputs that go into food production. And I had explored that piece of it, but I kind of realized, oh wait, the, you know, turning on and off lights and how we fill our cars up doesn't really get people too excited, but what we put in our mouths, you know, three plus times a day does. And it, there's a real intimacy and it's a way of, it's an amazing frame for a story. Um, I was also kind of not, I didn't really align myself with sustainable food as a sort of practitioner. I'm not a great cook. I, I'm a sort of failed backyard farmer, backyard gardener. Um, and um, I had dinner with Michael Pollan, uh, uh, I guess it was about five years ago, and um, had said, you know, I love the, the principles of sustainable food and what you are, you know, encouraging people to do, which is um, eat eat food, not too much, mostly plants, I believe, is the Michael Pollan sort of maxim. And, um, and I've had a lot of trouble with that. Uh, I have tried and failed to be a vegan and a vegetarian and to you know, be a, a virtuous eater. Um, I have a pescatarian. Little, and a pescatarian, and I have, I have little kids, and I've tried to kind of do right by them and their you know, diets. But you know, I, I, I like processed snack foods. I keep going back to the barbecue. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. You, you, you know, there's potentially the option that you, the possibility you might be homis, you know, you might be murdered if you tell people to become vegan. <laughs> in Nashville, Tennessee. That's not totally true. We have a lot, there is a community of, of um, backyard farmers and you know, I have friends with chicken coops and pe paleolithic diets and all that. But I came at this from sort of the outside and there was a lot of freedom for me and in, in doing that. And, and I asked Michael Pollan, how do, we, how do we begin to fix the problems in our food system if we can't necessarily rely on a critical mass of backyard farming vegetarians to do that from the ground up. And, you know, there's you know, a lot of pressure on eaters to be virtuous, and um, it takes time, it takes creativity, and so even if for me, as someone who was very informed about the problems with the food system, if I wasn't able to sort of convert my life to that, what he, you know, Pollen and Bittman and Alice Waters and all were proposing, I thought, how do we do this? How do we bring sustainable food beyond sort of the elite uh, who can enjoy that lifestyle and um, make it pragmatic? Um, and it became an interesting story to me for that reason. So before we get to the how, I want to take it back to what food means for you emotionally. So growing up when you and Rufus were kids, describe the food situation at home. That's a great question. And now my dad is here also, so he can, he can contribute. We had family meals were ritualistic. It was, we weren't actually allowed to, um, and I have friends from high school here too, who uh, we, we, we were required to be at the dinner table at 7.30 every night. We had candlelight. Um, and uh, it was a time where we came together and were always expected to um, contribute and talk and con connect. And food was a sort of proxy for love in some ways in, in my household and I think it is for many many families and so I understand how emotional this topic is when you tell people that they have to think about radical changes in you know food system and their diets it's it's very threatening um, uh, and meat was a big part of our um, of, of our diet red meat in particular uh, and I mean almost so much that you know 
fish and chicken were sort of considered like vegetable matter, and uh, you know those were like the, our vegetarian nights. Um, so who, who did the cooking? My mom did, and she is an excellent cook, and um, my grandmother was as well. And um, I grew up loving that you know, receiving what for them was really this boundless and very generous way of showing affection was feeding us and feeding us with beautiful meals. And um, and so I have not done as good a job as a mother uh, feeding my children um, beautiful meals, but, um, but I do understand the importance and the emotional importance of food for people. Mm-hmm. So where did you even begin? So you decide you're going to tackle the subject, you get your book deal. Where does the reporting begin? So along the way, I had been writing about the environment and climate change. And um, and I w- read in 2014 um, an IPCC report, the International Panel on Climate Change, um, wrote that uh, given current trends in, 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 in climate and environmental pressures, um, by mid-century, we would reach a threshold beyond which current agricultural practices could not sustain human populations, large human populations, which is a pretty extraordinary thing to read. In fact, that's almost verbatim. Was this the same study that said we all need to start eating bugs? No, No, this was was just like a straight up IPCC report and buried on page 67 or something. It was uh, buried on page 67 for the the record. Um, It was... uh, you know, it was stated that there that that ba- basically um, crop yields will decline two to six percent every decade going forward indefinitely, um, and that uh, you know is the big sort of paradox of our food future, right? Is that we are living in a moment where. Um, decline in crop production um, is occurring alongside growth in population. And so, you know, you have um, population expected to swell to uh, 10 billion people by mid-century. Hold on one sec. Should we switch mics? Yeah. Hello? Is that, is that right? OK. Do you, is that, ta- OK. Um, uh, so we have this, this these, you know, um, on the one hand, increasing supply, I mean, sorry, increasing demand by a long shot, and um, what is predicted to be significant disruptions in supply. Um, and, uh, and we see that actually right now. For example, in the Midwest, you know, the, the, store, the soy and corn farmers are struggling to get their um, seeds in the ground because there have been terrible storms and the soil is um, very, you know, wet and they can't actually get their sort of um, production online. Um, you see it uh, in Italy. We heard recently that there were, you know, Italy was running out of olive oil because extreme weather had affected the um, very old uh, um, olive groves in Italy. Um, you see it uh, in my region. Um, the Georgia peach growers and the Florida citrus growers are dealing with really significant um, challenges with shifting seasons. Um, I have interviewed many, many um, producers of coffee and cacao who are having a lot of trouble with, um, you know, uh, in, uh, fun- fungus and uh, orange. Uh, rust fungus, it's called, um, invasive uh, insects, forest fires. So a lot of this is b- having really pr- sort of practical impacts on farmers um, in so many different regions. Uh, and um, it all adds up to a single um, story, which is climate change is becoming something we can taste. Climate change is becoming a, a, a you know, a kitchen table issue. Um, and uh, I, you know, started with that sort of central question. How do we feed a hotter, more crowded world. Where is the farthest flung place you went in the reporting? Uh, well, uh, remote Ethiopia. It's true. I, I embedded with famine workers um, in Ethiopia and was looking at famine response and sort of what you know are the sort of most serious I- impacts. Because for some of us, it's the quality and, uh, and 
and availability of a Georgia peach or you know our favorite Chardonnay and, and strawberries. And for subsistence farmers, it's a serious question of survival. I mean, there are at least half a dozen countries, tens of millions of people who right now are facing famine, um, in part due to significant environmental pressures on the food system. The responses to the, that famine, the responses to the um, disruptions in supply in those regions has gotten better than it was in, say, the 1980s when we you know, heard a lot about um, famine that was causing death. But um, you know, famine is a reality in, in, in for you know, many populations. Um, so I wanted to see what that looked like and what a, a reasonable response is. Um, I uh, was in Kenya, Ethiopia, um, India, different parts of, uh, of, of India, uh, um, Mexico, Israel, China. I mean, it did, I went to, I think, 13 countries and 15 states. Uh, I want to jump ahead to the question that I'm sure is on everyone's mind, and it, it's been on mine from page one to the end of it. It was on my mind when we met for dinner earlier, and I was like, oh my God, what the hell can I order in front of Amanda and not have her judge me for being an awful person after reading the book? And um, I mean, the biggest question is like, what, what can individuals do? So this was, you know, I think it really, it was important to me not to come at this as... And let me, let, sorry, let me interrupt for a second. And not just individuals, but, but mindful individuals, like people who care deeply about the food system, who really care deeply about what they put in their mouths, their children's mouths. You know, all of you, I'm sure, frequent the Union Square Farmer's Market, things like that. Yeah, What can I, we all do? So, I am a meat eater. I, as I have confessed, eat, you know, processed snack foods and I'm not um, a virtuous eater as, uh, as many who write about this issue are. Um, and I have found that the absolutism that comes with a lot of the kind of prescriptions that we hear about this is what you should do to live a good life as a, as a, you know, as a, as a cook or a mom or a, you know, a, 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 you know, someone who's devoted um, to food, uh, you know, and wants to live a sort of virtuous, sustainable food life. Um, I did not go at the, at this book as someone who was going to give sort of, this is what you should do. Right, that's the, why I'm asking you now. <laughs> I wanted that answer in the book. The, the, um, the thing that- Not has, a self-help book. <laughs> yeah, no. Maybe was, you can do that next for us. Um, I would say the single biggest impact on my own behavior as an eater is food waste and the way that it has affected my relationship to the food that comes into my home, that is wasted in my home, um, that is wasted on my plate when I order um, and over order and over buy, um, and uh, the institutions that I want to support uh, you know, along the way. Um, but I, I would say that there is an opportunity for you know, all of us to really consider the food waste problem and um, more than 33% I believe it is of the food that is grown globally is wasted uh, either it rots in transit or is thrown out um, it's an extraordinary amount and there's a lot of interesting innovation around food storage um, that can help people you know um, you know reduce food waste in their homes and help restaurants and um, you know grocery stores and stuff address food waste and I looked at that um, but for me the you know pretty significant shift personally was to really come to grips with that and um, you know my personal relation to the issue made it you know helped me connect to the bigger problem of waste and greed in our society um, and um, I will also say that you know meat is a major thing and will always be a thing as someone who does eat meat um, the environmental impacts of meat are enormous uh, of meat production um, and they're becoming more significant so as we go from 7.5 billion people to you know 10 billion by mid-century, 9.5 billion. Um, the diets are becoming more protein intensive, and um, just in the last 50 years, there has been a doubling of um, global population and a tripling of meat consumption, which is an amazing trend, right? I mean, it's not just that more people are on Earth, it's that diets are becoming more protein intensive and meat intensive, and so, can, you know, becoming open to, um, plant-based meats and these meat alternatives we've heard a lot about, Beyond Meat, the massive IPO for Beyond Meat, um, 
you know, c trying those options out, can, in my case, exploring lab meat, which we may want to discuss, right. um, is part of what, for me, this book was about. Yeah. It was about opening sort of my mind to different options that could become serious new sort of aspects of my diet. All right, so let's, let's talk about the lab meat or cellular meat, which was a term I did not know until I read your book. It sounds like a, something out of a horror movie. Cellular meat. Has anyone tried the Impossible Burger? here? Oh, good number of people. Did you like it? Um, so Amanda has tried... So Amanda has tried most iterations of the Impossible Burger. Can you describe what it is for those who haven't had it? So the Impossible Burger is one of those things that has been a big surprise to me. I mean, I don't think when I started reporting this book four years ago, it never would have occurred to me that a burger that presents itself as plant-based protein with artificial animal blood in, you know, that makes this veggie burger bleed. Um, that's the way it was presented. I think the first, pe the first coverage of this was in the Wall Street Journal, and it, the headline was the veggie burger that bleeds, and that was probably three or four years ago. And it was this kind of super creepy thing, and why would anyone eat this? And now, you know, fast forward to 2019, I think it was last month, you know, the company announced that they're in every Burger King, or almost every Burger King, they're in White Castle, they're in Shake Shack, um, they're bringing these products into the mainstream in a very fast, you know, and uh, at a very fast clip. And part of it is, and I see some of my students from Vanderbilt are here, which is amazing. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, part of it is the, you know, millennial and Gen Z consumers who are um, pushing these trends. And I interviewed um, my, uh, the CEO of Tyson Foods and uh, um, Cargo Meats, and they said it's these younger consumers. They're comfortable with, you know, um, with products that are really kind of a step change. Um, they're comfortable with alternatives to dairy. They're, you know, and uncomfortable with alternatives to meat. And um, you know, this is a reality for us. And so. Plant-based meats was sort of my way into this this sort of emerging market, this emerging field of meat alternatives, um, and then I, you know, heard about actually through Tyson, the Tyson CEO, um, this realm that is known as cultured meats or um, cell-based meats. And uh, essentially, it, it, it involves taking a biopsy of cells from a live animal, from the muscle and the sort of tissues that we eat when we eat meat, which is fats, muscle, and connective tissues, um, grow, creating an environment in what is basically like a sophisticated crock pot um, called a bioreactor, creating a, an environment, a sort of liquid environment in which the cells can replicate, which cells naturally do. They just need the right sort of um, conditions to do it. Um, and then they let the cells do what they do, which is, you know, grow into this mass of meat. And I um, ate freshly harvested duck breast from a bioreactor um, about, I guess it was like half a year ago or something, um, at the headquarters of a company called Memphis Meats, which um, has been... Uh, has received investment from Tyson Foods, from T Cargo Meats, and also from people you recognize like um, Bill Gates and Richard Branson and um, a lot of sort of tech investors. And we're sort of comfortable hearing that this is where Silicon Valley is going with their thing. But what fascinated me about this story was that it was the, con the meat industry. Uh, I mean, the you know traditional meat industry. I mean, Tyson... Um, uh, kill, you know, harvests, shall we say, um, two point, I think it's actually 1.3 billion animals a year. Um, they um, uh, produce a lot of animal-based meats, and they're, inve they're investing in Beyond Meat, and they're investing in these lab-based meats. Um, so to my mind, it was, why is the meat industry self-disrupting, and why are they going this way? And um, the CEO of Tyson Foods said to me, um, 
if we can produce the meat without the animal, why wouldn't we do that? Raising animals is very um, resource intensive. It's very cost intensive. It takes years to get, in, in the case of, a, of cattle, to get them where they need to be. Um, and uh, what we're selling is, you know, basically about half the body mass of what we actually raise, which is, um, uh, you know, includes the bones and the organs and the hide and whatever. And it takes a lot of resources to do that. So yes, this makes sense for us if we can do this. Um, all that is to say that when Uma Valetti, the CEO of Memphis Meats, called me up and said, hey, would you like to come to my laboratory in Berkeley and eat um, bioreactor duck meat? I was like, yeah, <laughs> totally. So I did. And I'm still alive. Right, and you're leaving out the one crucial thing. How did it taste? Well, um, it tasted very meaty and, uh, and very ducky. <laughs> Although I'd only had duck, you know, maybe half a dozen times in my life at most. So I don't know duck meat all that well. Did they do like a blind taste test? Or they no? did not. Okay. No, it was pretty much me and this lump of, it was, you know, about this size um, of, of duck meat that I think was valued at like probably $800 or something for, you know, an ounce of, of bioreactor duck breast. Um, and I did have to sign my life away um, uh, before I ate it. And um, it basically said, this is ex an experimental product. And, um, you know, if you die, we are not responsible. And, uh, and Uma Valetti, who uh, is a cardiologist and a very reputable doctor from the Mayo Clinic, um, said, oh, don't worry, my kids have eaten it. It's totally fine. You're, it'll be fine. Uh, and so I ate it and was totally fine. It tasted very much like meat, and the, you know, which is because on a cellular level, on a molecular level, it is meat. It is just meat you know, detached from the, 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 the body of the animal. Would you let your own kids eat it? Yeah. I would. I mean, the, you know, this is a very early stage in the process. These products are not on the market. Um, I mean, the plant-based products are, of course, very available in your local Burger King. Um, but, um, and they, they, that has synthetic blood, you know, this sort of heme product that we can talk about. But, um, but essentially, it's, you know, it's, you know, at, again, the, the sort of most fundamental level, it is meat, and it is grown with fairly natural, you know, processes. It is just totally freaky to think about it, right? Um, uh, when they put this, um, you know, lump of, of sautéed duck meat in front of me, I went to cut into it, and... Um, and Uma said, no, 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 don't, don't use your fork and knife. Um, actually pick up the meat and pull it apart and sort of play with it and see how it behaves, which I thought was very interesting. <laughs> and I thought, like, OK. Uh, I started pulling it apart. And it felt at first sort of like trying to wrench apart a bouncy ball or something. And then, and then he, what he wanted me to see was how the striations of the muscle would pull apart and how it held together and how it was this very sort of contiguous piece of muscle tissue, which is exactly what it was. And uh, it pried apart just like you'd be pulling apart the meat of a duck breast or something. Like it was stringy and did all of that. And, um, and, and he, you know, said like, that ain't your grandmother's veggie burger, right? Like it is a very different product. Do they have chefs on their advisory boards? Like who are they working with on the culinary side of this? Do, would you like me to recommend no. Terry Bell? No. <laughs> um, Maybe eventually. Yes, they right do. Now. They actually do have um, chefs that they work with. Yeah. And um, and that has been um, the, uh, actually that was the trajectory of the Impossible Burger. Um, they have not put, um, the, the product in grocery stores, mm -hmm. they have put it into um, restaurants. And right. they first David got, Chang was the first. That's right, to David Chang, Momofuku, mm -hmm. and then um, uh, a bunch of restaurants, early adopter restaurants in San Francisco. Um, Tracy and Desjardins. Yes, Tracy Boston. Desjardins, mm -hmm. exactly. So oh, no, San Francisco, yeah. It was like tastemakers, mm -hmm. and to normalize that in a restaurant environment to make it sort of um, prized for its flavor um, was, uh, and that's actually when I first. First aid. It was at, at the um, uh, IPCC. Uh, the um, I think it was actually in um, Copenhagen or Paris, but it was at a, a climate conference. And Tracy Desjardins and, and the Impossible Meat folks were there and passing around these early stage Impossible burgers and um, sliders. And uh, and that was sort of 
the, one of the sort of early prototypes of the product. And I've eaten it along the way um, in, you know, over the years. And it's very interesting and sort of eerie, but that the product keeps getting better. And it's a sort of it's sort of like I drove the first Prius model in 2001, and then I drove you know my model that I got in 2004, and then the sort of current one. And you know it's a product that just keeps evolving and getting better and sort of more familiar to people. Um, and it's again hard to think about food in that context um, as something that's getting sort of optimized for flavor. But, um, but that's how it is. And I think if the meat industry wasn't itself so flawed and so sort of inherently problematic, and, um, and I'm talking about mass production of meat. So craft meats and small scale meat production and sustainable meat production, um, there's a lot of great um, you know, meat that can be had that's great for the environment. But mass scale meat production um, has a lot of environmental problems and, san and sanitation problems and contamination of the meat. So when you think about that, and I've been to many facilities of you know, mass-produced animal facilities, uh, CAFOs they're called. And um, when you think about those problems, what then you, be, you begin to relate differently to what these you know, meat alternative folks are trying to do. Um, yes, there are aspects of what they're doing that are unsettling, um, and, um, but, but they're dealing with an industry that is riddled with very unsettling problems. So it's like, which is harder to swallow. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about another Silicon Valley-based food that is not prized for its taste, and that's Soylent. You wrote all about Soylent. Has anyone tried Soylent in the room? <laughs> You're smiling. I, love, I actually love the flavor. No, you do not. No, I swear to you, I drink it like voluntarily. <laughs> well, the way Amanda described it, which is one of my favorite sentences in the book, is that it's a cross between uh, almond milk and pancake batter, which to me does not sound like the most desirable thing in the world. But that's another thing that came out of Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, you have tried that. You've spoken to the founders. Can you tell everybody uh, what Soylent is all about? Well, I think I also describe it as adult baby formula, um, which it is. It's like very weird to me that people want a food alternative, having described, as I did earlier, um, and as a devotee of Cherry Bomb and all the other wonderful places in which we relate to food as a thing of beauty and as, as a, a source of you know, um, pleasure and joy and soulful connection to people. It's like, why would anyone want to get that out of their lives and certainly you know, resort to adult baby formula, I, I don't see it. Um, you know, I was interested in this and exploring in the final chapter of the book this kind of realm of non-foods. Um, and um, Soylent is interesting in part because it's been very successful and there's, you know, tens of millions of probably now, I think it's about 82 bill or million has been invested in the company. Um, they're available at, you know, in Nashville, Tennessee at the local, like, Circle K um, and, you know, Target and all these places. It's, it's, it's a, a product with surprising success um, and in the same way that the Impossible Burger is a product with su surprising success. So I came at it, at it with curiosity. Like, why is this thing working? And why are people responding well to this? Um, and beyond that, um, it is, you know, probably $3.25 or something per drink, um, which is cost competitive with a Happy Meal. Um, it's a lot healthier in terms of the actual sort of nutrition, in, you know, conferred by that um, uh, drink. And the carbon footprint of that particular meal is vastly lower than like my kale and tofu salad that I would get, you know, um, at the local um, sweet green or whatever. Um, and so, you know, from a purely pragmatic standpoint, it meets a lot of the you know the, the the challenges that we're dealing with. There's one: how do you create food that's ecologically optimal? How do you create food that's uh, achievable and accessible, um, and uh, and that can be scaled? You know, in in that way. And so, that those that was why I decided to go for the that first um, Soylent. Uh, I had also just been to the U.S. Natick Research Laboratories where they make army food, and. Um, uh, well, I, food that, that, that nourishes all the soldiers, uh, all the U.S. soldiers. And, um, 
And they had shown me uh, 3D printers, and, and I was researching 3D printed, printed food, which is expected to be in the field for soldiers um, by 2025. And I had eaten these pellets that are produced um, from essentially pastes and powders that are in um, what is basically an adapted 3D printer that usually works with plastics. Um, but instead of depositing little drops of plastic to form you know, a structure, they're depositing little drops of um, liquefied food that then gets kind of frozen or dried and becomes a pellet. And in this case, the Army's very interested in this because they're um, you know, connecting this technology with um, sensors that are attached to the bodies of the soldiers that can read what their nutrient needs are. So soldier A needs, has like a, a low potassium and needs an extra hit of potassium. Soldier B needs more vitamin C. Soldier C needs whatever. That information could get sent to this 3D printer. The printer can then produce this food pellet that has everything the soldier needs and it can be sent, that information can be wirelessly sent into the field. And, or the pellet can be delivered by a drone or whatever. But the, this is the idea that I was exploring. And after that, and after trying these food pellets, I kind of thought, well, <laughs> I might as well try the Soylent. So I did, I did try the Soylent, having done something even weirder, which was explore the 3D printed foods. Um, again, this really sort of space agey stuff, the lab meats and the 3D printed foods, tends to be what people are really interested in talking about in this book. Um, and uh, there's a lot of research that I did on traditional food production, on permaculture, um, on ancient plants, and restoring nu nutrition to the plants, uh, the crops that have become so nutrient poor in you know in, in 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 our culture. Um, I looked at edible insects. Um, I looked at a lot of you know solutions that are you know consistent with and supported by sustainable food producers, um, but. You know, Terry Gross and others have been like, "Wait a minute! So, what was it like to eat that lab meat and uh, and eat the three D food pellets and the soylent?" Um, but Wait, I have to ask you about before you get to the the nice food. I do want to ask about one more, and no spoiler alerts here because it is the first chapter. So, um, the, preppers. the preppers. I have to confess, I didn't. I really didn't know anything about that. Can you tell everybody who the preppers are and what they're eating? Yeah, so the book opens in a factory that's producing um, survival food. And, uh, and my other brother, who is not here, um, was the one who actually got me into, interested in this in, in the first place because he started stockpiling food in the basement of his cabin in West Virginia. Um, my cousin-in-law was also stockpiling food in the basement of his house in Indiana. And my um, stepbrother uh, was stockpiling food in his basement in um, Washington, D.C. He's like a sort of very different, um, these are very different people living very different lives, although they do have one thing in common, which is that they all are like dudes who own guns and sort of uh, live a life that is probably a little bit paranoid. Makes but it even scarier. She's yeah. not talking about canned goods. We're not talking about like Little House on the Prairie, things pickled and canned and down in the basement. What That's are we right. talking about? We're talking about freeze-dried survival foods. And this, again, was an interesting story from a business standpoint because the survival food industry has tripled. Um, actually, I'm sorry, doubled in three years. So there's been a lot of, um, you know, growth in this little sort of, you know, tiny industry. Um, and so I reported this um, actually for Miranda, uh, who is uh, an amazing editor and was at Bloomberg at the time. And I wrote this um, uh, piece. And it was about um, you know the survival food industry and why it was growing so quickly in this particular sort of company that was on the front end of this. I have and to stop you one second. Did anyone even know there was a survival food industry? You did. Well, you're one of her students, aren't you? Yes. No, no, you you no, knew about... It's like a weird tech thing. Tech people are very strange about this. Wait, you two are the only two people raising your hands. Did anyone else... You. Okay, three people. Yeah, this was all new to me. I mean, I knew freeze-dried ice cream from visiting the Smithsonian and getting the astronaut ice cream. But that's, that's right. Yeah. It's very, yes, it's that, it's that thing. It's that freeze-dried thing. Well, I mean, you know, the, the, interestingly, the, um, the CEO of this company who, who brought me into this 
production facility where the book starts, um, and I'm rifling through this giant vat of vegetables. Um, uh, I think I describe it as with all the heft of confetti. I mean, they're basically like these little vegetable chips that are lighter than air almost, and, um, and I'm just wondering what the, in the world I'm doing. This story is very strange. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I eventually figure out thank goodness, by the end of the preface, why, why it was there, um, and the bigger story that it was leading in, me into. But um, their target audience, or their target customer, for a long time was the, the prepper, the, you know, the Unabomber guy who was like off the grid and preparing for end of times. And in fact, it's in um, um, Salt Lake City, Utah, which has a big Mormon community, and it's actually part of the... Um, uh, part of the community to prepare for end of times, and and so they were they were really meeting the needs of a very niche market, right? Um, what happened was that they started getting um, a lot of demand from uh, um, suburban markets. Um, they they called them um, guardian moms from moms who are worried about the safety of their kids. They were getting calls from people who had lived through Hurricane Katrina. Um, they started supplying um, relief uh, efforts for. For, um, Hurricane Maria, Harvey, Irma, et cetera. Um, they were helping people who had been living through blizzards and they couldn't get to the grocery store for a long time. So they basically said, our, our, the market is telling a story, and that is that there's a lot of concerns about increasing environmental pressures on the one hand and diminishing sort of government safety nets on the other. And that's why, you know, that's what's driving this growth. Um, so again, you know, for me, I have not ever purchased survival food, and my much, although my brother has encouraged me to do so. I don't think my other brother has either. Um, and I am too optimistic to think that we'll get to the point where we need it. But the story interested me that we are in a moment where people have serious concerns about food safety and disruptions in food supply. And that drove me to continue exploring this. How screwed are we, basically? Um, and, uh, and it was a really interesting sort of narrative tension for me as I explored all these different frontiers. So we are totally screwed, but you, throughout the book, remain very optimistic. Why is that? Well, it, it was a hard-won optimism. I think, you know, as I said earlier, the, you know, when you look at the fact that there are, you know, thousands of scientists who are, you know, internationally putting out reports um, that, you know, and, and climate models showing these kinds of increasing pressures on food production globally. I have visited famine re regions affected by flooding, affected by drought, affected by fires, affected by invasive species and um, diseases, crop diseases. Um, those pressures are very real and intimate and tangible for the communities that are dealing with it. Um, the the notion that we are moving into, you know, in 30 years, um, you know, the next generation is going to potentially, um, you know, live in a world where the, you know, existing agricultural systems cannot support human civilization is really harrowing. But you did note in the book that we always think that. That's right. Yeah, I mean, dating back hundreds of years. For thousands of years, this story of we're running out of food is million, I mean, is not millennia old. You know, we have asked this question over and over, will humanity outstrip its resources? Um, and time and again, generation after generation, um, that urgency um, triggers and engages the survival instinct. We adapt and survive. We adapt and survive. And as, you know, Plato said, necessity is the mother of invention. This is, you know, what, this is the story of our species. We are very good at adapting and surviving. Um, we have a sort of double whammy challenge, which is that there are a lot of existing problems with the food system um, that need to be addressed. We have to sort of, the, we, there's a lot of, you know, fear around technologies applied to food because we've messed it up so many times. We, you know, it's, again, you can come up with solutions that 
uh, are really ineffective and damaging to public health and the environment. Um, so we have to solve those problems, and we have to prepare for these problems to come. And I was really interested in finding a way to, you know, uh, to look at innovation that was supporting um, the principles of sustainable food and, you know, ecologically sound food production, um, uh, but also harnessing the best, you know, innovation and technology of our time. And um, and 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 I found a lot of examples of of really interesting and hopeful progress. Um, but as I said, you know. For me, it wasn't necessarily, is this going to work? Are we going to all be eating lab meats in 20 years? Or, um, you know, is, will we have to use GMO and CRISPR? And will we all have, you know, big data and drones feeding us and robots in the fields and all that? But it was more, this is what's happening now. This is where billions of dollars of investment are going right now because the problems and the pressures are that real and that immediate. And somehow for me, exploring the solutions and exploring the way that all these innovators in these various aspects of food production all over the world and dozens of different countries and, and, and states were exploring this was for me a way of coming to terms with the problem itself. And um, and that was why it was a sort of hard won optimism that you know no I'm not stockpiling food yes I think my you know children and their children and grandchildren will survive um, and I do think that we will solve a lot of the problems in in our food system with better design better um, um, with much more efficiency um, uh, but we're doing it because we're coming up against really serious pressures and that is important and especially as we talk about you know food and the in relationship we have to it it's it's seductive it's 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 emotional um, we don't want to hear that the you know the ways in which we're going to you know um, produce food make food grow food are changing radically that feels very threatening um, um, but it's also something that people really care about um, so those of you who are the you know the, the tastemakers and who, who, you know, show people how to care and, you know, what um, food at its best can be, can really engage a huge audience in topics that are so closely related to food, yet we very rarely talk about, you know. You mentioned CRISPR. Can you tell people what that is? Yeah. So, um, you know, CRISPR is a form of genetic editing. How many people are familiar with CRISPR? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bigger group. This is, um, uh, we've, wh who's familiar with GMOs? Yeah, everybody's. A, so GMOs is genetic modification, genetically modified organisms, um, and uh, CRISPR is genetic editing of plants and other organisms. And so it's a sort of, you know, it's a sort of cousin of GMOs, basically. Um, but it's a much more accessible, affordable way of um, breeding and altering plant genomes to have, you know, um, either good or bad characteristics. Uh, and, uh, and this is a really hard one to talk about, because everybody comes at this question of GMOs with a lot of concerns. Um, and we've applied GMOs in a really dangerous way so far. Um, but I was looking at scientists in Western Africa who are um, developing uh, or working on uh, b ways to help plants adapt to drought and um, invasive insects. Because these smallholder farmers that have one and two um, acres where they grow maize, um, the you know, their fields are getting destroyed. That is their, you know, um, caloric um, sustenance. It is not grown, you know, corn in Western Africa is not grown for ethanol and, um, you know, um, corn syrup. It's grown for sustenance. And, um, and so for them, you know, looking at these tools and how can we maybe use this kind of breeding, these kind of breeding tools um, to, um, help us adapt and survive. That was important to me. It's a very different conversation than should we label corn chips. Um, it's how can these tools, this platform for plant breeding, help us adapt and survive to new pressures. Um, so I was looking at it outside of you know the, the 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 debate in the U.S. over this and about you know sort of the the science in another um, realm. 
so I didn't uh, give you this question in advance, but let's say the United Nations named you food czar. What would be the first two things you would do? My, I rewrote this question a few times. Originally, it was like if the Trump administration named you food czar, but then I realized that would never happen in a million years. So I went with the United <laughs> it Nations. It wouldn't be me, that's for sure. It's probably um, be like the head of 7-Eleven or something. <laughs> they um, I, um, there are really two very important sort of areas of focus. And, and when you get into food policy, it's, it's like really hard to keep everybody awake <laughs> um, on, you know, topic, on, on, you know, on the topic of food policy. But bringing in incentives for farmers to sequester carbon, which, which farms can do, is really important. So there are all these methods like no-till farming that can be incredibly useful in um, you know, using farms as a carbon sink and sequestering carbon in the soil. Um, that's a really big thing. So putting you know, um, price incentives um, and, er, in, in place that farmers can be part of the solution is really important. Um, we hear about cap and trade um, in you know, the energy industry. So it's a similar sort of concept in farming where farmers would be incentivized to um, become you know, carbon part of the sort of carbon sequestration strategy. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of unused farmland. And um, there's a big movement to try to restore um, uh, pre-agricultural you know, um, trees and, um, and, and manage the lands that are sort of defunct farmland and it, with trees and um, uh, much more sort of sustainable um, ecological systems. On, on that farmland. So those are two areas which, again, it's very, it's not, you know, I would like to tell them to fund, you know, lab beets. No, I would, I would try to see how we can look at agriculture as a broader system to become much more sustainable and part of um, long-term solutions that are, you know, um, about restoring trees and sequestering carbon. So I have one last question, then we'll open it up to the audience. But um, you pointed this out to me, and embarrassingly, I didn't even notice it. You know, Cherry Bomb is all about women and food and supporting all the different women in the food world. And your reporting was so engrossing, it wasn't really until I got to the end when I realized most of the people you interviewed are men. Yeah. And that it, why are there so few women in this space right now? That's a really good question. <laughs> I was so frustrated along the way reporting this story. And I've been writing about tech and the environment for, I mean, 20 years, basically. And um, it's true for a lot of, you know, technology, tech journalism. I was at the Bloomberg headquarters earlier today, and I counted, like, five women in a sea of, you know, a thousand men. Um, you know, tech and business journalism is pretty um, male-dominated, and um, a lot of the IT and, um, you know, a the reporting I did was not just farmers, and farming itself is, is, is pretty male-dominated, but um, a lot of the, the, the people I interviewed were, um, if not farmers, they were scientists, they were engineers, mecha mechanical engineers, roboticists, um, artificial intelligence experts. Um, these are fields that are very, you know, um, tech forward and have a lot of dudes. Um, I, um, the head of the research laboratory at um, Natick lab Labs for the Army was a, a, a really fascinating woman. Um, Ruth Onyango, who's a, an activist and an educator for smallholder farmers in Western Africa and bringing um, new um, resources and tools to the farmers, is a woman. I, along the way, I think I had three or four really strong women characters out of you know, um, probably 15 main characters in, throughout the book. Um, so it was, it, was, it was tough. And there were times when I wanted to kind of shift a chapter to focus on a woman character. For example, Rose Wang is a really interesting young entrepreneur who is in her late 20s, I believe. Harvard grad who started this company, Chirp Chips, that is trying to bring edible insects into the, I see some nodding heads, trying to bring edible insects into sort of mainstream stream diet. Chirp Chips? Chirp Chips. Chirp chips. You, should, you should profile her. In Terry Bob. She's really cool. Um, but I mean, her, the work she's doing in terms of, you know, are we going to all be eating crickets as our main pro source of protein wasn't 
it, it's not there yet. I mean, in terms of a major potential solution. Um, so it would, I would have been forcing the story to center on a character who was working on a really important um, you know, area of innovation and focus, but wasn't really solving, like, you know, for example, the problem of meat production, right? Like, so I decided to focus that chapter instead on um, Uma Valetti and, and, and Memphis Meats and so on. So there were moments when I wanted to basically report the story differently so I had more <laughs> female characters and decided against it because it was, would have not been sort of true to what I found. Um, but there are more of us. There are more of us and more of us who are getting into tech. I am, you know, know a lot of people in this audience who are in tech and who are, um, uh, who are women and, um, and in science and uh, in, you know, engineering and in food. And so, I mean, I remember talking with you about this. The food space and the restaurant world is heavily male-dominated, too. And so um, there is a... There's a rising tide of, of, of women influencers in all these spaces. Um, but for now, yes, this book had a lot, of, a lot of male characters. Was your daughter always this optimistic growing up? Well, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, does anyone have any questions for Amanda? Do we have a mic? You said the problems that we're facing as a species in terms of food production have been going on for millennia. Do you think that um, while that's do you think that while that's true that we're living in a moment where um, the future is more at hand than it's ever been, that the solutions are more palpable or reachable than they've ever been? I thought Amanda to, to, was Googling the answer for the second thing. No, I know. I, I, I'm totally, I just, by the way, joined social media because I was told that I, I needed to by my publisher. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and so I have these moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, I should probably Instagram this. <laughs> I should take a picture of the audience and put that on that Instagram thing. Um, so that's what that was about. Uh, yeah, I think that is so, it's such an interesting thing that is probably as old as, you know, civilization too. this sort of neck and neck thing where the solutions tend to sort of evolve alongside the problems. And it seems almost uncannily, um, you know, appropriate that so much of what's you know, emerging right now um, in IT and robotics and, you know, big data and uh, all these areas of focus and, and biotech and everything seems to be, you know, capable of addressing some of these problems that are at hand. And a lot of this stuff is actually, you know, some of it has been around for a long time and it's just sort of coming online in a new way. Um, but that is a really sort of, it, it struck me as a really sort of interesting and, um, you know, coincidence, essentially, that, like, the, the problems are intensifying and the solutions are, you know, um, are, are becoming available um, at, the, at the same time. So I, I, it is, you know, there's a... a, a um, a historian at Columbia University named Ruth DeFries, who has an amazing book called The Big Ratchet, if anyone is interested in uh, agricultural history. Um, and uh, she talked about this long-running technological continuum in agriculture, where you know, since the first plow was developed in, I think it's like 6,000 BC Samaria, um, the story of agriculture has been a story of new tools and methods coming online to create more food with less human effort. And that would then sustain greater and greater populations. And so the Green Revolution um, following World War II, which as we know was very fraught because it brought a lot of you know, agrochemicals into play and um, breeding uh, methods that um, people have a lot of legitimate concerns about, um, that, you know, for all of its problems, ended up tripling global su food supply. And in turn, population, global population tripled. Um, you know, you, you can't, we can't grow, I mean, and one of the big questions I should get and often get is, um, how important is, you know, um, uh, population control, right? Like maybe the problem is should we not keep growing more food? Maybe we should slow the growth of, of the human population and that's another book altogether. Um, but, you know, essentially, yes, 
we've had massive population growth and a lot of these solutions that have come online have enabled that or you know c happened in response to that but um uh, these, you know, problems and solutions evolve alongside each other and have done for, again, millennia. And that um, is why I say yes. I think we are at a, in a better position right now to solve these problems than we ever have been. Hello. Thank you for the great conversation. Just to follow up on the question that you asked, Carrie, about uh, what can we do, I, I always just kind of grapple with, is it the consumer's responsibility or the private sector's responsibility, the companies? If you were to tell someone with a finite amount of energy to spend their focus eating local, growing local, or to try and get companies to source closer to home and more sustainably, what do you think is the more efficient path uh, worth fighting for? Yeah, I mean, so that's, that, this question of supply chains and local food is really a, an important one. And um, I think the statistic is that the average piece of produce travels 1,500 miles from, you know, the field where it's produced to the plate. Um, and, um, you know, shrinking that, um, you know, the amount of refrigerated trucking that needs to happen in our food system is a massive problem. We were talking earlier about, um, I signed up for Daily Harvest. Have any of you heard of this? this company Daily Harvest where you get these like smoothie, frozen smoothies that come in like packaged dry ice and they arrive and it's like supporting a vegan lifestyle. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's so much, there's so much packaging and waste and shipping and FedExing and whatever -ing that goes on to like get you these vegan smoothies that it seems like it really doesn't really shake out. This cost benefit analysis doesn't totally no pun shake out. intended. In. Yes, thank you. I was not at all intended, but thank you. I'm feeling very, very quippy. Um, uh, so, you know, some local solutions, though, aren't necessarily beneficial, right? There have been a lot of um, analyses, supply chain analyses, that show that locally produced foods in um, greenhouses, for example, um, uh, and um, locally, local aquaculture, for example, I did some reporting on aquaculture, um, can be more energy intensive than um, foods that are shipped, um, you know, longer distances. The amount of energy that goes into, you know, maintaining greenhouses or indoor aquaculture facilities can actually be greater than, you know, shipping things over distances. So it's a tricky, there's not no simple solution as to should we, you know, eat locally. And um, there's no doubt at all that if you can reduce the amount of meat in your diet um, or, you know, really source your meats from, you know, small um, integrated farms, um, then that's much, has a much better impact on the environment and probably on your body. Um, and moving to plant-based diets, I mean, there's so much abundant evidence that um, it's better for your health, it's better for the environment to have plant-based diets with meat as a condiment. Um, that's all very, very true. Um, I, also, I also think part of it that so, and, and, you know, backyard gardening, I'm, I've not been great at it, but yes, getting your fruits and vegetables from non-greenhouse, you know, um, local farms is a hu has huge environmental benefits. Um, um, the, there's, we have to be realistic, though, because, you know, one, this area of food waste was really eye-opening for me. And one of the major problems um, with food waste is, is increasing, is, is relying on sort of increasingly perishable foods. Like the big culprits um, in this National, National Resources Defense Council um, study um, of the food waste was happening in middle upper income homes with um, you know eating a lot of kale and like leafy greens and you know parents trying to give their kids healthy foods that they throw out and um, you know that there's actually a lot of you know um, contradiction and hypocrisy in the lifestyles that um, we're encouraged to live highly perishable foods, um, you know, over-purchasing um, and, uh, you know, letting stuff rot in our fridges. Um, so, you know, 
definitely plant-based diets and definitely low, less meat and definitely sourcing local when we know that it's from a great um, source. Um, but but also becoming aware and willing to sort of come to terms with our own hypocrisies. Um, it was important to me to write this book as someone who didn't do a great job backyard farming and who hasn't had a good track record as a vegetarian and a vegan. Um, because I think living sort of this absolutist, you know, in living in, 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 in with a sort of absolutist attitude about I have to completely eliminate this or that, um, turns off a lot of people and can really limit the way in which we can get everybody involved in this. Um, there's a central theme in the book, which is I support you know what I call third way approaches to food and food production, um, and that is as I touched on a little bit earlier, it's it's not all or nothing. Like it's not going to be all you know um, uh, you know reinventing food with technology, and it's not going to be all de-inventing food and moving away from industrial agriculture. Um, it's going to be sort of doing the best of both paths, using the best principles of sustainable um, food production and, um, and drawing from the best technologies available. So what you get that list of what should I do, part of it is I think we have to have a more realistic conversation about this topic. Um, I think we have to, those who are sustainable foodies have to open their minds to what some of the tech folks are doing. The tech folks have to listen to the sustainable foodies. Um, we all have to, you know, come clean when we, you know, waste a lot of, uh, of the food we buy and we, you know, um, fail at being vegan and vegetarian and just get a little bit more pragmatic. And that, I think, will take this a long way, take this discussion a long way, and also recognize these, these big connections between the environment and, and food and climate and food. Um, and th that is... I think really essential to taking this conversation to the next, next level. Yes. How much of food waste has how much of food waste has to do with people throwing away their kale they didn't cook? I mean, isn't it a much more corporate actually corporate generations of you know stockpiling corn that doesn't sell, wheat that doesn't sell? I mean, isn't this the the thrown away produce a really minor part of food waste? It's amazing that actually residential food waste is a majority of the food waste. I was really surprised to find that too, but according to the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, residential food waste is a major part, collectively, when you look at all the food waste. And there have been waste stream analyses, and what's coming out of residential food waste is 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 pretty staggering in terms of just the, the sheer volume of it. Um, the b other big issue, which we you know talked about a little bit, is uh, these really unrealistic aesthetic standards we have for food, right? So a lot of the waste is on the farm because they don't sell the sort of misshapen you know, red pepper or the you know, uh, too small cantaloupe or whatever. And so that is just food that's left to rot in the fields and never gets purchased by the grocer. Um, and so we've heard about the ugly food movement and sort of efforts to get consumers buying more, um, you know, uh, foods that are, um, you know, unappealing visually. Um, and that's certainly part of it. But um, yeah, what's wasted in grocery stores, what's wasted on farms, and what's wasted in households, um, you know, all of it is really is really a significant problem. And what's wasted also, you know, again, in transit, when we're trucking food thousands of miles um, and a and refrigerator and the truck breaks down, you know, out goes tens of thousands of pounds of bananas or whatever. I'm not bananas, because that's shipped from uh, Central America usually. But anyway, the point is that you get the point. I mean, there are many different contributing factors to food waste. Um, and um, residential food waste is shockingly high um, in the area of problems. And I'm not saying, in no way would anyone who is you know, at NRDC say, this is a reason to stop buying kale. It's just get more realistic about the way in which your life is contributing to this. And they also said that households that are composting <laughs> often waste more food than houses that don't because people feel better about the, the composted waste, right? Um, and the real problem is not what you do with the waste, or the real sort of opportunity is not necessarily what you do with the waste, but avoiding the waste in the first place. Um, and so, again, you know, it's, 
it's about getting sort of really realistic and pragmatic and and I, I in no ways is an argument against eating a very you know a, a diet rich in plants it's just a you know there are a lot of contradictions and we don't really talk about them yeah Entrepreneurs, innovators, all these things about packaging. <laughs> Carrie knows that this is an obsession of subject. mine. Um, but so, for example, I at a recent thing did those uh, the lettuce that you discussed. And I haven't had the opportunity to read your book yet, but I know that you went to a place in New Jersey that's like yeah. growing lettuces in the air and whatever, and you harvest the lettuces and pluck them off these things. And I don't actually know if it's the exact same farm, but one of these people was at the event, and I was like, oh, these lettuces taste great, but they come in these ginormous plastic clamshells. And I was like, I'm not going to buy that product because yeah. it's in a clamshell. And and I said, you know, what are you guys doing about that? And she said, well, we're working on it, and we're trying to make these really sturdy, so maybe somebody would actually want to reuse this clamshell. And I was like, well, I don't understand why you guys are creating this product that's supposed to be so environmentally less harmful and just making more plastic clamshells. And she said, well, we're growing so fast, we don't have time to make a better clamshell. And like, this is my really, the thing that I'm most angry about is that there is all of this like innovation going on. And like my friend and I just had dinner at who before we came here. And you know, everything is just covered in plastic and it's so healthy for you. There's just packaging everywhere yeah. and all of these companies that are making things that are supposedly so much better like they are not building the systems or the new packaging equipment to deal with it and it's across the board like the guy from Valdor who's Valdor's doing all this amazing stuff to reclaim all of their waste so that they can turn it all into dog food and I said well what are you doing about all the packaging and about all the saran wrap on every single palette and nobody's doing anything about it. I know there's loop. I know that yeah. there are these like I mean composting those bioplastics. <laughs> At least two people in this room think they're bullshit. Yeah. But but the the so even the dis, like the, the things, disconnect. Yeah, the so, disconnect yeah. between innovation and creating and being healthy and like the reality is the reason why we have these global climate problems isn't just because of cows and methane, it's also because of all of the plastic that is in our water yeah. and our soil and everything we're consuming that's everywhere in our oceans. And like, what did these people say to you? I don't know. It, it makes me angry that I feel like people, the companies are not being held accountable on that level. Like you are making millions of dollars off of your product. How are you putting all this crap out there all the time? Yeah, it's a great question, and the um, and I will, Gail. You might remember that uh, chapter six, I think it was of of Power Trip, um, was all about plastics and the plastic industry and efforts to move beyond um, the you know incredible petrochemical inputs that go into plastics. And I am so thirsty, and I'm not actually opening my single-use plastic water bottle because I'm afraid of what might happen, and it will jump out of there and and make everybody return their books. We, I put mine over there. We do both not, refused our plastic water bottles. Not, oh, perfect, perfect. Is that is that is that a single-use plastic? Oh, it's a juice place that, and I reuse my old juice bottle. Okay. Bravo. Well, yeah, but think of all the energy that went into making this. Yeah. Well, and Carrie, you've done a lot of research into um, you know plastic alternatives and bioplastics and all that, and um, it is not something I get into in detail in this book. Um, uh, and so I, I can't, I, you know, I think it's a very under-researched and under-explored area of, of focus. Um, the um, the answer is that you know it's one of the many problems that need to be addressed, and um, I think you know. The weird thing is that the solution for, you know, for example, corn-based plastics would then put a lot of um, new 
you know, pressures on monocropping, right? And we need to grow more corn to produce the, you know, biodegradable plastics that are then going to encase the food that we're selling. Um, and uh, as we know, there are a lot of challenges with, with corn production. So um, that is serious, a serious issue, and I, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I, it may, may mean that the next book I write will have to get deep into packaging and the, the story of packaging. But, um, but no, I mean, you know, the, the idea of getting more local, and, you know, it's Aero Farms is this company that Anna's referring to that uh, actually somebody from Aero Farms was maybe going to come, and I don't know. I, I don't think she did. But, um, uh, but, um, she, uh, the Aero Farms is growing these, what are called, um, aquaponic farms, vertical farms, um, in Newark, and they have facilities, um, there are also, there's Bowery, um, which is another aeroponics, um, uh, facility, there's, um, Plenty, there are all these new indoor cropping facilities that are coming online, and their argument is, when you, you know, get the, lettuce or the perishable produce out of Yuma, Arizona, and Salinas Valley, California, and you put it in Newark, the amount of, you know, um, you know, savings from, you know, a carbon emission standpoint um, and a resources standpoint of putting that production nearby um, is, um, you know, far greater than, you know, what you could save from the, the pla re reinventing the, the plastic clamshell. That's not to say that the plastic clamshell should not be reinvented. Um, and, you know, the world of recycling is a really important world to, to explore. Um, but uh, that, you know, that clamshell is going around every kind of, you know, baby green out there. It's not just the, you know, local, you know, uh, vertical farmers who are using it. It's everyone. Um, and they're saying, well, how about we take transportation out of the mix and, um, and just get this, um, get this lettuce closer to where people are eating it because it's so costly to trip and refrigerate and so on. Um, so it's one aspect of a solution. It's not the whole solution. Um, and I agree with you that you can't think about this without having a really sort of holistic view of um, the whole picture. Um, and uh, the nice thing is that I was on a, a contract and I kept trying to get more time to write the book and add another chapter. And uh, my very patient editor said, get the thing in, put it out in the world, don't try to solve plastics right now. <laughs> um, so next, next thing, you gotta leave something to explore. All right, we have time for one last question. Oh, you're good, okay, you win. conversation around food politics and like food deserts. Um, Nashville has like an immense food desert, like the Edge Hill neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and just like even, you know, I bet New York and like if you go up to Harlem and different areas, like the discrepancies in access to food and, you know, what government subsidies, how they play a role and, um, you know, real estate and real estate developers and choosing where to put grocery stores and Trader Joe's versus Whole Foods versus a Burger King and zoning and things like that. I know that's a super long conversation, maybe another book, but if you could yeah. briefly mention. Well, no, it's a great question. And there were two aspects of this book that I, um, you know, uh, wanted to um, explore in more depth. And it was hard to keep the, um, you know, story contained and connected. I mean, um, as I mentioned, this is a book that pops around to many, many different countries and places, and, and so um, keeping a through line was uh, one of the great biggest challenges. Um, um, immigrant immigrant and the, the immigrants and their role in agriculture and the way and food justice and the food justice movement is a huge and very important area of focus um, and um, food deserts and and food justice and availability is a huge um, part of uh, the story for me you know this is one of the major problems with with the, with sustainable food and the inherent elitism in the sustainable food movement um, is that the argument that you hear from, um, you know, many of the advocates in that um, field is we've got to get comfortable with paying double and triple 
um, our food prices. Right now, I believe f the food budget in the average American household is about 13% um, of, the, of, of the total household budget. Um, in the 1950s, it was about 30% of the total household budget. And there's a big ar there's an argument that that's been you know part of what's driving the decline in um, um, nutrition um, is that we're becoming really um, unrealistic about how much we should pay for food. Um, and uh, the, the problem is tell that to, you know, um, the single mom with three kids working three jobs. You know, it's very hard to make, you know, to say, hey, everybody, let's go back to making food 30% of your household budget. Um, it's a good art. It's, it, it, it's great. And I mean, for me, you know, our food is a much bigger part of our household budget than 13%. Um, um, but a lot of the solutions that have been proposed um, by sustainable food advocates have been with the assumption that either you have that kind of you know, disposable income and you're willing to make that decision to make food more available um, or not. The question to my mind is how do you make accessible and achievable sustainable solutions that can affect the system broadly? It's a systems problem. Many of this is, you know, much of this is a systems problem. And um, so, you know, a decision, for example, in it, that I explored in how do we get chemicals out of the food system and how can we use AI and robotics? I don't think we talked about that. Did we talk about that? Um, but, uh, you know, talking to um, folks who are trying to find ways of reducing by more than 90% the fertilizers and herbicides and ke um, chemicals that go into the food system. That um, ultimately has huge implications for, you know, low and middle income consumers. Um, you know, be the guy who, Pat Brown, who's the um, owner, uh, I mean, the founder of um, Impossible Foods, he will say, you know, bringing plant-based proteins into Burger King is a way of um, bringing healthier alternatives to lower income consumers. Um, you know, so there are many sort of arguments of how do you do affordable food better and more sustainably? That doesn't solve the problem of how do you get markets into food deserts. It does, solve, it does begin to address some of the problems of how do you do large scale food production uh, better and smarter. And, um, and so, you know, I did explore it in the, you know, some of your questions in those terms, um, but, not, but not on the level of local food deserts. And, uh, and, um, and it's a really important area of focus. equating the sustainable food movement with elitism because the sustainable food movement is the food justice movement. And it's really easy for people to say that. I don't. I don't know if that's true that the sustainable food movement is the food justice movement. I think there are, yeah. I think there's overlap, but I do think. looked at this and has been looking at this from the beginning, even Alice Waters, I mean, you can poo-poo her her high-end food, but she has done a lot to try and get farmers market food into low-income houses. Like, I just think it's really dangerous to be that sweeping with the word elitist about people who spend their lives trying to... Oh, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I think I think that Michael Pollan and Alice Waters, and by the way, I have worked, cl I have interviewed and worked closely with both of them, and I totally appreciate their efforts. The 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 work though is still fairly limited to maybe 20% of the U.S. population. It is not at this point accessible to the vast majority of consumers, right? And I'm not saying that it won't become accessible. Yeah, the Tyson food making, um, you know, animal lab protein is not making healthier food for people. That food is that food is hardly healthier than meat. I mean, well, there is uh, incremental. I, I'm, I just, I think, I, I'm sorry, I just, the elitist word I think is dangerous and, and too easily used. But I think more people who care about the sustainable, who care about sustainable food, need to care about food justice. I don't, I think there's a huge gulf in between those two things. But it's the sustainable food movement who came up with the term food desert. I mean, it's, that's where, that's where the mm -hmm. understanding has, that's who's brought the focus to the problem. Yeah. I mean, Francis Moore Lopez's Diet for a Small Planet is one of the ordinary texts on sustainable food and 
making sure everyone can be helped. I do think we're mixing up a few things, I, and I, I think we both agree with what you're saying 100%. But I wish everybody who, who shopped at farmers markets cared about food justice, and they don't. And that's the reality. And we have to accept that. Well, a lot of the people who shop at any store don't care. I think you're probably going to find more people who care at the farmers market than you are at Costco. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, that's a, it's a great debate to end on, and I think it's terrific food for thought for all of us to take home. You I, know, just, if you well, care. I, I mean, so that we can wrap it up with a, I, these were concerns that Michael Pollan and Alice Waters and them were all, are all dealing with themselves. I mean, this is a, this is a question they're wondering, how do you bring this beyond um, the, you know, um, the sort of contained environment in which they're 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 functioning and make it available to a broader um, you know to a broader on a broader scale to consumers and so I don't I don't say it I I, I think Car uh, you know Michael Pollan in particular would 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 talk about the inherent elitism and the problems with that in you know um, high cost local organic food production and that as a as a problem that he's concerned about too I don't think it's I'm not like accusing them. I'm saying I think it's implicit. There are a lot of people in, in sustainable food who are concerned about the, the narrowness of it. And that is, um, that, that I don't, I, I don't, I did not mean to use the term elitist as, a, as an accusation. I meant to use it as a, I think, a, a general sort of accepted reality, which is that it's very limited. It's very expensive. It's very limited. Why tons of bottled plastic water are never called elitist? But how elitist is it to buy tons of plastic bottles of water? I mean, who gets called elitist now has become so disassociated with what elitism is. I have other words for people who buy bottled water, but we can save that for the next conversation. So um, we have to end there. Uh, thank you. And thank you to everyone who came tonight. Amanda. I mean, thank you. Amanda's a mom. We didn't even really get into that. And the fact that she has just dedicated her life to putting this book out into the world, we uh, such a debt of gratitude to you. So thank you for doing thank this. Thank you. That's so nice.